2 Kings chapter 5. We're going to jump right on into this. 2 Kings chapter 5. If you'll join me in prayer. Father and our God, we're grateful that you call us to worship, to catch our attention, the start of a week, to get our focus back on you, where it needs to be every day. But Father, we get distracted very easily. And I just pray that you would indeed speak, not by the voice of flesh and blood, but by the power of your Holy Spirit. May we hear the voice of Jesus here to this day and, and show us the direction you want us to go. Thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. Yeah, let's see. Back in the late 80s, that's when I started liking country music. There was a period of time, and I really was a window there about five years where I really, really liked country music, listening to country music stations. And I developed an appreciation for the band, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band at that time. I know they'd been around a while, and they'd been on my bucket list for a long time to go see them in concert. And I finally had concert tickets, and I still have concert tickets because my first casualty of COVID-19 was this concert was canceled. The date on this is uh, March 19th. And the last time I was out before COVID hit, I was March 18th. 
So I have some cool, I have a cool souvenir here. Back in the 2000s, they recorded, Jeff Hanna wrote a song, and they recorded it, and it's a song that could be sung in church. One of the things that we did when we were doing Broken is I always encouraged the musicians to sing secular songs that could be songs sung in church. I think the best love songs, the purest love songs, are songs we could sing to God or that God would sing to us. And they wrote a song called The Broken Road. And the words go like this. I sat out a lot on the narrow way many years ago, hoping I would find true love along the broken road. I got lost a time or two, wiped my brow, kept pushing through. I couldn't see how every sign pointed straight to you. Think, think about the years I spent just passing through. Like to find the time I lost and give it back to you. You just smile and take my hand. You've been there. You understand. It's all part of a greater plan that is coming true. Every long lost dream led me to where you are. Others who broke my heart, they were just northern stars. Pointing me on my way into your loving arms. This much I know is true. God bless the broken road that led me straight to you. And I could not help but smile when Jimmy started singing his song. I'm going to start sending out texts early because he paid attention to the text. The title of the message this morning is The Broken Road. And man, that song just brought a smile to my face. There you go. There's a twosome right there. Two, two great songs. This morning, we're accompanying one lone pilgrim walking the broken road. This is the story of Naaman and his encounter with the prophet Elisha. His trek to salvation was along the broken road, but instead of going straight to God, Naaman took a roundabout way to the Father. In the words of Supertramp, he took the long way home. He went the long way around the barn of belief. His journey of faith should have been a straight shot involving about four stops, but instead it took twice as long as that and included about eight stops. Instead of traveling the expressway of obedience, Naaman took the meandering back road to healing and faith in God. This sermon is especially appropriate for our day for the road to redemption. is seldom straight, and straight anymore, and the road to brokenness is often a zigzag. You are the persons who recognize their deep need for God early on in their lives. Not only to save them, but to rule them. I'm afraid many allow Jesus to be their Savior, but they will not allow him to be their Lord. Or they keep fighting him over issues of lordship in their life. And that in itself will lead to brokenness. Because you see, Jesus is either both or he's neither. And those who do seriously consider giving their hearts to Christ to do so after much deliberation, sometimes waiting until circumstances, crises in life, point out their utter dependence upon God. Many is the person who has exclaimed with the dirt band, God bless the broken road that led me straight to you, God. God bless the broken road that led me straight to you, Jesus. First thing we'll see traveling on this broken road, name it. Is a man who is broken by his need. Broken by need. Verse 1, it says, Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier. There are five things we learn about Naaman right here. Number one, he was the commander of the army. He was the number one military leader of Syria. Number two, he had the respect of his king, King Benedict. Number three, he had the respect of the, of the people. He was the number one national hero. Number four, he was a valiant soldier. He was brave on the battlefield. He had great ability. He was the type you would want to follow in the battle. But, the last part of verse one says, but he had leprosy. There's the flaw in his wonderful resume. Therein lies his brokenness, his need. The Hebrew word for leprosy can be used for a lot of things, a wide variety of ailments. For example, leprosy could refer to mold in the house. It could refer to ringworm. It could re refer to psoriasis, as well as true 
leprosy, and it's amazing to me, sometimes you read scholars, and they, sometimes scholars, not all scholars, but just some, always want to explain away a miracle. It seems to be their thing. And there are some who think that Naaman probably just had a skin rash. Not as serious a disease as really leprosy. Friends, I don't believe that Naaman went out of his way to see a prophet named Elisha because he had mildew in his house or because he had dandruff. He had leprosy. His disease was serious. It probably struck fear in his heart. Otherwise, a courageous man suddenly was fearing for his life. And although it appears in the early stages he knew what he had, he knew what was coming. He knew what he had to look forward to. He knew that his hair would fall out. His fingers and toes would fall off because the nerve, would, there would be no feeling there. His gums would be absorbed. His teeth would fall out. His eyelids, nose, and palate would rot. His condition was serious. It led to brokenness. His need was great. And so was ours. Because the Bible often refers to leprosy as a type of sin. Leprosy then was incurable by human means. And our sin is incurable by human means. Paul described our sin in Romans 7, 24 this way. He says, sin is a body of death. Sin is a corpse. Sin is rotting flesh. There's not a one of us here today who has not traveled the broken road, broken by sin, and broken by the need for forgiveness. Verse 2 says, Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. I love this little servant girl because she had every reason to hate her captors. <laughs> she could have thought, I know someone in Israel who could heal my master, but because of what he's done to me, let him rot. But still with genuine concern, she willingly gave a word of testimony. She stood as a signpost on Naaman's broken road, pointing the way to the only one who could heal Naaman. So here's Naaman on the broken road. He's broken by need. Next we're about to see he's broken by disappointment. He's about to be. He's about to take the back road here. Verse 4. Naaman set, went to his master. Naaman receives this good news. Went to his master, the king, and told him what the girl from Israel had said. The king of Aram replied, by all means go. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. He has a letter of reference. He takes 10 talents of silver. That's over $42,000. He takes 6,000 shekels of gold. That's $1,200,000. He intends to pay the person who can heal him. Verse 7 says, As soon as the king of Israel read the letter from the king of Aram, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? You sent this man to me to be healed? Am I God? I, I can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow, indicating the king, why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? Ah, see how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me so that we go, go to battle. You can imagine the scene here. He probably says this in Naaman's presence. Naaman is fraught with expectation. His king has sent a letter figuring this king would steer Naaman in the right direction. But instead, King Jehoram, the king of Israel, burst into a whining fit. All of a sudden, Naaman's heart had to be in his sandals. 
He's no closer now to being healed than he was back in Aram. And maybe at this point he thought, you know, this is just a cruel joke. My little servant girl's pulled one on me. This is not going to happen. I know a little bit about how he felt when I went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary there in Fort Worth back in the 80s. I'd served a lot in, as a, with an uh, uh, associational missionary. I was involved heavily in associational missions. And right next door to the seminary was Tarrant Baptist Association. And so here come this country boy to the city. He goes in. I wanted to go see the DOM, the director of missions. I wanted to give him my resume. And I still remember hearing the conversation coming down the hall. The secretary went back to the DOM. He comes down the hall and I heard him say, I'll see him, but I don't want to. And then when he brought me in his office, I gave him the resume and he pulled out his file cabinet and there were resumes stacked there. And he said, I'll put your resume in here. I mean, it was one of the most discouraging. My heart was in my shoes. I felt a little foolish. I felt a little jaded. And that's exactly how Naaman is feeling right here. His king meant well, but he had sent him to the wrong person. He was broken by good intentions, yet bad advice of a friend. We need to understand there are a lot of religious hucksters out there. There are a lot of Christians who give advice that is not godly. I'm constantly amazed at how I hear people say, this, this was said and I, I just accepted it. And what was said to them coming out of the mouth of a believer was so opposite of God, it was not even funny, it was scary. There's a lot of people who will steer you in the wrong direction. Well-meaning people thinking they're helping you. Jesus made it very simple. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to God the Father except through me. It's all going to God. To God. The, the counsel we receive needs to line up with the Word of God. Therefore, that's why we need to know the Word of God. So instead of being closer to a cure, Naaman seemed farther away. Verse 8. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel, Jehoram, had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Hooray for Elisha. He's the instigator here. Like the servant girl who stood along Naaman's broken road when Naaman was broken by need, Elisha stands on the broken road where he's broken by disappointment. King Jehoram was clueless. He didn't know where to send Naaman. Through the beckoning of God's prophet, though, he returns, Naaman returns again to the straight highway that will lead to healing. He's broken by need, disease, a circumstance of life, a byproduct of living in a broken world. He's broken by disappointment of a well-meaning friend. Now he's about to be broken by his own actions. We're about to see that he's broken by pride. Beginning with verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stopped at the door of Elisha's house. He's on the straight and narrow again. His long journey is about to pay off. He pulls up in the yard of the man, the one who can, can heal him, and his entourage is with him. He's ready to make the payoff. He expects red carpet treatment. And yet, instead, Elisha does something odd. He gets a messenger boy instead of getting Elisha. Verse 10. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him. Now, where is he? He's out at the front door. He's out at the front gate. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. He's been given instructions from the man of God. Verse 11, but Naaman went away angry. Hmm. He's broken by need. He's been broken by disappointment. Now he's about to be broken by his own pride. Naaman, who said he wanted to be healed, stopped short of obedience. 
His desire for healing had a head-on collision with a wall of pride that was in his heart. you got to ask, what was it that ticked him off? Well, the Bible tells us. He said to himself, I thought that he would surely come out to me. It's the first thing. Elisha did not come out to him. I brought my money. I'm a big man back in Aram. I deserve to be catered to. You don't know who you're dealing with here, Buster. His pride had been offended. Elisha, though, he's not being rude. You know what he's doing? He's led of God to do what he did. He wants Naaman to know who will do the healing. It's not flesh and blood. He wants Naaman to give credit to God and God alone. So that's the first thing that ticked him off. He said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. And there's the second reason he got ticked off. Elisha failed to come out and put on a big show. He expected Elisha to go through some religious mumbo-jumbo. He was expecting religious ceremony. And what he got was a call to faith. His expectations had been shattered. That's a big problem. A lot of times we get expectations of how God's going to do what God's going to do, how God's going to heal us. And God's got other plans. God's not bringing it through the front door. God's coming around the back door. God's bringing it, he's bringing, he's bringing the same thing, but he's just not doing it the way we invent in our minds that he's going to do it. His expectations have been shattered. He wanted to command his own healing. He wanted it done his way instead of God's way. And many attempt to do this with their sin. They want to buy their way into the kingdom of God by doing more good deeds than bad deeds. I've seen this played out in a few movies. I think that's the whole premise of Godfather 3. We want to buy our way into the kingdom. Buy our way into God's good favor. We want to pay for our healing without yielding to God. And then the third thing he says, third thing that ticked him off, Verse 12, are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Now I know we have this wonderful image of Jordan River. Let me tell you something about the Jordan River. In many places, it's nasty. It's muddy. It's black water. And it was back then and still is today. It's not the most beautiful river in the world. Everybody wants to go grab a bottle of it, and, or uh, uh, yeah, a bottle of it and bring it back when they go to Israel. But what Naaman was saying is that water is too nasty for a person in my position. And at this point, I'm wondering whether he wants to be healed or not. Seriously. He almost missed being healed because of his initial unwillingness to follow Elisha's simple command. Such a simple thing. Likewise, there's a lot of folks who are unwilling to follow Jesus because of the simplicity of the gospel. They look at the whole idea of blood. That's offensive. Ah. That's barbaric to be baptized in the blood. That offends my social propriety. That's not politically correct. My friends, it doesn't matter what we think. It is only by God's grace that we will be saved. It is only through the blood of Christ that we will be saved from our sins. It's only through the death of God's only son that we can leave the broken road behind to the loving arms of God. There's been many a person who stood right where Naaman is standing, dying on the inside. 
infuriated at God that the answer is so simple. Trust in him. Trust in Jesus. It's so simple, and yet it is so difficult. Trust in Jesus. Give him everything. Simple, but whoa, that's a high price. Verse 13. Naaman's servants went to Naaman and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be clean? I got to say it again. Hooray for these guys. <laughs> they speak words of wisdom to their boss. They speak truth at Naaman's last stand of resistance and encourage his obedience to God. Verse 12, 14. So Naaman went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Now, when Naaman went down in that water, I cannot help but wonder what was his attitude. And I cannot help but wonder, did he notice any change with the first dip? My theory is he did not. My theory is that he went under six times nothing. I don't think the change came. I don't think there was any evidence of healing until that seventh dip of obedience. And when he popped up out of that water, he looked and scripture says his flesh was like that of a young boy, fully, fully restored. <laughs> then they, verse 15, and all his attendants went back to the man of God. They're now going 50 miles out of their way. They were going to go back and see Elisha. He stood before him and he said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. And then Naaman says, well, you know, if, if you're not going to receive this, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the, but the Lord. In other words, I want some holy ground to take back with me. But then he says this strange thing. He says, but, but may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down and he is leaning on my arm and I bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. <laughs> he just made his proclamation that God is the true God. But I mean, God, God of a compromising situation here. I, I, he's already committing himself to. Yeah. He's blessed. Because Elisha says to him, go in peace. Go in peace. You're just starting on the right path. God, if you keep trusting God, God will teach you. Every person here this morning is in this story. Either you are currently traveling on the broken road. You're broken by need. You're broken by disappointment. Maybe broken by your pride. We're all here somewhere. You're either on the broken road broken or you are one of the servant signposts along the way because you did you did you catch that it's like one of the most important truths in this story at every fracture of naaman's brokenness there were faithful servants present pointing the way back to god when when naaman was broken by knee there was a young jewish slave girl who said i know a prophet in Samaria. When Naaman was broken by disappointment and King Jehoram didn't have a clue, Elisha said, <clears throat> bring him to me, send him to me so that he may know there's a prophet in Israel. And when he was broken by pride, his own servants said, if he had asked you to do anything hard, over and over again, and this is who we ought to be, this is who we need to be. We live in a broken world. You know, that's, I'm not telling you anything new. 
What we got here is a servant sandwich. Elisha's there in the middle, big prophet, and on both sides, common folks like you and me. Just pointing the way, just pointing the way, just pointing the way. And that's why we're scattered out here in the world, wherever we're sent. Every day, encountering broken people. If you look for them, you will see them. And my encouragement to you, let's do our, let's do our task. Let's have our eyes open. We need to be out there like holy hitchhikers awaiting broken travelers with the firm assurance that God will lead us to those whom we can help with what we know. If you follow along the next few verses, I'm going to let you and encourage you to read this on your own. But you will see that Elisha's servant, Jehazi, he was like, mm, you should have taken some of that money. And he had in his mind, I'm going to go out there and chase him down and tell him to give me some. And I'm going to offer some reason why you should donate to this cause. And that's exactly what Jehazi does. He gets some of the money. When he comes back to Elisha's house, Elisha says, where you been? I've not been anywhere. And Elisha says, the leprosy that Naaman had is now on you and your family for not being a faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, you're calling us to faithfulness. And I just pray that we would be obedient to your call and do what you're asking of us. Father God, I, I know and I trust that we would not do anything as disingenuous as this servant of Elisha's who was misguided for a moment, put his eyes on money, put his eyes on what money could provide, took his eyes off God, and he paid a price. Let's pray you open our eyes to the need. And Father, if we're on that road right now, help us to understand you're pointing the way back to you already. Take us where we are. And it's okay sometimes to confess and resolve, to, 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 to confess and declare, I'm broken. Because all of us are broken. It's who we are. It's not all we are. Thank you for your message. Thank you for your work. May it continue to produce fruit in our hearts. In your name I pray. Amen. Stand single, 156. Oh, mm -hmm.